right, looks like we're ready to get started. Good evening and welcome to this general election debate in Legislative District 28. I'm Ben Giles. I'm a reporter with the Arizona Capital Times. We cover the legislature very closely, so thank you for having me here as your moderator. Um, before we begin, uh, I do have a couple of requests. I'm just going to reiterate some things that were said previously. If you haven't already, please silence your cell phones and please refrain from any interruptions during the debate. This is being recorded so folks can watch this later um, and also recorded for our post captioning services. A little bit about our host of uh, the debate tonight, the Clean Elections Commission. The Citizens Clean Election Act is a campaign finance reform and voter education measure. It was initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. As part of its role, Clean Elections provides clean funding for qualified participating candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and its rules. Those rules include contribution and spending limits on their campaigns, foregoing special interest money, and participating in debates like this one. Having said all that, uh, debates like this are audience driven. Um, you probably noticed me scrambling up here looking through index cards. That's because you all have a lot of questions. We have a very uh, healthy, lively audience tonight. We're looking forward to that. Um, so if you haven't already, please utilize those note cards. We still have staff and volunteers around in the audience who can take those cards from you, even in the middle of the debate. They'll bring them up to me. I'll take a look at them and, and we're gonna try to get to as many as we can tonight. Uh, I, I promise uh, we won't get to all of them, but we'll try. Um, if you need additional cards, again, just raise your hand and staff will bring them to you. We've scheduled roughly an hour and a half for this debate. Just to go over the format one more time with our candidates, during the first half, I'll be asking a question that all six candidates will have an opportunity to answer. Um, we'll take turns who gets to answer first. Uh, everyone will have a chance to answer the same question at that point though. Uh, you'll have a minute each, and for the person who is the first to answer a question, I'll also offer 30 seconds as a rebuttal just to finish, finish, th finish your thought at the end there. Uh, at the second half of the debate, I'll be asking questions of specific candidates. So some of you have already sent me an index card that has uh, a candidate's name on it. That way I know uh, who to direct the question to. When we get to that portion of the debate, I'll give you the candidates two minutes each to answer those questions. Um, and if, if there's someone else who isn't asked the question directly, but you have something to say on that topic, just maybe give me a wave or a nod or a wink or something, and uh, I'll, I'll let you chip in for about 30 seconds. Uh, finally, we'll also allow a minute for closing remarks each. And uh, just one more note about the questions. A again, they do come from you, the audience. I do screen them for clarity and just to ensure we're not asking the same thing twice, three, four times. Um, and we're also looking for questions and not personal attacks on candidates or maybe a, a campaign speech or something like that. So uh, again, we ask you to remain polite to all of our candidates. Please give them a fair and uninterrupted debate no matter how strongly you may disagree or agree with what they say. Um, having said all that, if we're ready, let's get started. We'll have a minute each for opening statements and we'll start with Christine. All right. I'm Christine Marsh. I've spent my adult life making sure that children's voices are heard. I've done it as a teacher for 27 years. I've done it as a foster mom to six kids as the 2016 Arizona Teacher of the Year, and as a mom. It's important to me that children have a voice. Right now, they don't. The reality is that our children are suffering the consequences of inadequate funding because of the status quo. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been slashed from our education and healthcare systems because of our legislators' decisions. We need fresh voices, strong leaders. I want to create an Arizona where our kids' voices are heard, an Arizona where they are moving forward instead of falling behind. Traveling the state as the Teacher of the Year, I realized that I could not persuade our legislators to do what's best for kids, so instead of changing their minds, we need to change them, which is why I'm running. Thank you. All right, thank you. Kate? Thank you to the Clean Elections. Commission for hosting this and thank you everyone who came here tonight. Appreciate the audience. So my name is Kate Brophy McGee and I'm running for the LD28 Senate 
and I am the education champion in this race. Don't ask me, don't take my word for it. Look at the organizations who have endorsed me and given me many awards over my tenure in the legislature. Education is not the only issue I champion. I also work on behalf of causes important to LD28 voters and the voters of Arizona, such as health care, children and families issues, neighborhood safety, small businesses. I look forward to sharing my accomplishments in these arenas as we go forward tonight. And thank you again so much, everyone, for coming. Kelly? Thank you. Uh, thanks to Clean Elections, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight. I'm Kelly Butler. I just finished serving my first term in the legislature as your state representative. Um, I'm an Arizona native. I grew up within the boundaries of District 28, and I raised my family here. Um, my, along with my husband, Ben, who's here, uh, I'm a small business owner of our family's dental practice. We have two grown sons. They are graduates of our in-state universities, and they're both serving in, actually, they're both now in the Navy. Um, and it has been an honor and a privilege to represent you at the Capitol. I've worked hard to get things done. I've worked with colleagues across the aisle, and I've co-sponsored legislation that passed and was signed by the governor. I've worked um, with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to improve legislation introduced by some of my Republican colleagues. And I found it really rewarding and, and, and quite a surprise to be able to really help constituents down there, too. And I was pleased to be able to help a lot of constituents. Um, I, we have some, still have some big problems in our state to solve, and I am glad that we're here tonight to talk about those. We are, remain at the bottom in education funding, we still have a teacher crisis. Too many families are unable to afford health care. We have a lot of things to talk about tonight, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Aaron? Hi. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone. I'm pretty sure the last time I was in this ballroom, it was somebody's bar mitzvah in my seventh grade class. So yeah, I th there we go. It might, might be my sister who just stood up back there. So it's great to be back here at the point after all these years. I knew something was coming back to me. Um, it, it, I grew up here, born and raised, and this state and this city really made me who I am. It was a very optimistic place. Um, didn't matter where you came from. Everyone came here from somewhere else. And what really mattered was how you acted. That was the most important thing. And I was very lucky. I am the best teacher I ever had was about a mile from here, my third grade teacher at Madison Heights. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time. And I had a family that convinced me I could kind of do anything I put my mind to. I didn't realize it at the time, but our leaders down at the state capitol back then were doing the same thing. They were working together, Democrats and Republicans, to do big things for the state. And the state really worked. We were in the middle in K-12 funding. We were the fastest growing state around. Um, and we inspired a whole bunch of citizens like me to get involved and try to make this country a better place. Um, I want to get back to those days when we're focused on what's good for all Arizona, not the narrow special interests. Thanks so much. Kathy. Good evening. I'm Kathy Pappas Petsis, and I'm running for the State House here in Legislative District 28. I grew up here in Legislative District 28. I attended Madison Rose Lane. I attended Central High School. My children have attended public schools here in the district. And the most significant and important things in my life have happened in this Legislative District. I'm Greek Orthodox and attend Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral. I am engaged in this community, unlike many that are here on the dais with me, I have spent my community service for 25 years dedicating my life and my volunteer hours to many sorts of groups and organizations. Because of that, I have the distinct pleasure of having Bill Gates and Steve Chukri as co-chairs of my campaign, and many, many organizations have endorsed me. And what's interesting is they have endorsed me solely or they have endorsed one or other of the incumbents. So I think that perfectly places me as well situated to represent this legislative district for you down in the Capitol. And Maria. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. When I was here two years ago, uh, I shared with you I was running for the first time for state representative and you, you gave your, me your confidence. And I, I shared with you my experience of growing up as an immigrant daughter, the daughter of public school teacher, product of public schools myself. And I promise you, because of my background of 25 years as an attorney, assistant United States attorney, assistant attorney general, and being a mom to public school children myself, two of whom are here tonight, um, 
I shared with you that I could hit the ground running, and that's just what I've done. And if there's one thing that you take away from tonight about me, I hope you know that I have delivered results in acting more legislation, sponsoring and enacting more legislation, bipartisan legislation, than any other new representative down at the State House. I built a reputation working across the aisle. We, I'm very proud of my rape kit testing law where we cured a backlog of 6,000 rape kits so that now women have justice. And my prescription drug law that lowers the cost and acts, increases access to health care for seniors and many others. That's why I'm down at the Capitol and I'd be honored to continue to serve you. Thank you. All right, so we heard it in some of the opening statements. Uh, I've gotten a lot of questions about education already tonight. Um, so let's just start with a kind of broad strokes question uh, about school funding. That was the primary topic of debate down at the legislature um, these past, uh, this past spring and uh, up through May. There was a budget that uh, did increase funding and there is a promise to continue to increase funding for education over the next two years. Um, is it enough? Is more needed? And uh, if so or if not, why? And we'll start with Kate. Thank you for that question. <clears throat> I was proud to be the sponsor of the bipartisan bill Prop 301 extension, which passed with a supermajority of vote, supermajority vote, Republicans and Democrats alike voting for it. It was a bill that everyone said would never have a chance, and I found a way to get it done. That set the stage for a 20% raise for our teachers, which happened in the waning days of the session I was very proud to vote for that, along with significant restoration of capital funds. The question is, is that enough? And the answer is no. Following the successful and unprecedented passage of Prop 301, I established a Prop 301 task force with business and education interests from across the spectrum, the brightest minds there, so that they could in turn build the new Prop 301, which expired, the old one expires in 2021, we need to build the new Prop 301 for the 2020 cycle. We need to voter protect it, and we need to identify additional sustained sources of funding for education. Thank you. Kelly. Thank you. You know, I got involved in, in politics, which was something I never imagined doing, because I, I saw the cuts to education in my kids' classrooms, and this was 10 years ago. Um, and we are still $800 million short, adjusted for inflation and population growth, but $800 million short of what we had in education when my kids were in school. And it's not fair to the children today that we are not treating them, we're not preparing them for the future the same way that we did just, a, just a 10 years ago. Um, we have continued to cut budgets and we are not doing the right thing for our teachers. We know there is a huge teacher shortage that remains. We have a teacher crisis. You know, Red for Ed told us one thing that we have got to focus some more solutions on bringing more funding into education. Um, there are lots of solutions that we could we could accomplish more funding if we were to pull back some tax credits. We had a lot of, of talks at the Capitol about opportunities for more funding by removing tax credits that we're just giving away and bringing that money into more um, higher priority areas of our economy. So I'd like to have those discussions. They need to they need to occur and they need to occur now. Karen. I come at this pretty simply, which is, uh, it's to me just common sense that the people who got us into this mess are not gonna be the people who get us out of this mess, right? The reality is for 10 years, the Republicans, three of whom are sitting up on this dais, have controlled the State House, the State Senate, and the governor. They've made most of the decisions, certainly all of the decisions on funding, and our education funding is in a ditch. That's just simple math that anyone who looks at the numbers knows that's what happened. And saying that you're gonna stop the bleeding, to me, isn't really that praiseworthy. I'm looking to somebody who's gonna say, we need world-class schools that can actually prepare our students in this state for the jobs of the future. And to do that, we really need a different approach. One that's focused not on incrementalism, not on little tiny steps to try to make things less bad, but one that starts with a view of what, what does a world-class education look like? What does it mean to provide preschool to every four-year-old in the state, which we know saves money in the long term? 15 years this state has moved backwards on preschool, while 33 other states, including conservative Oklahoma and Ohio, have moved forward. It's time to ditch the people who got us in this issue and start moving to the future with a new vision for the state. Thanks. Kathy. Well, I may be a Republican up here on this stage, and I can guarantee you that I have got two good legs that know how to move forward. 
And so thank you, Erin, for um, identifying what you believe to be a problem. However, the situation here is that we have a funding formula that needs restructuring. It has been this way, and it is time for Democrats, Republicans, independents, it doesn't matter. This is not a partisan issue. Education is for everybody in this state. So we need to break down the barriers of what is going on with that education funding. We need to fund to what the needs and demands are for our students, one of them being, of course, teacher pay. It would be outstanding in a free market system that Arizona is, is to have competitive teacher salaries and a, and a lot of teachers fulfilling those roles. I think that's something that we can do. Now, not only is it K-12, we certainly don't want any child peaking in 12th grade, it's about higher ed as well, and vocational and community colleges and our universities that create opportunities for growth in our economy and growth here in Arizona. Maria. Thank you. Uh, I consider it uh, a good thing in my two years down at the legislature that uh, I'm the only representative that voted in favor, stood with our teachers, and voted for a 20% pay raise and a $1.5 billion investment in education. I co-sponsored the extension of Proposition 301 with Senator Brophy McGee. That was a success. I think that we are moving forward on education in the right way. We can always do more, and we will do more, but it requires a bipartisan approach and it requires people to look at the situation globally. I'm also the only representative that voted in favor of university funding. These are things that should be no-brainers. People should be standing with our teachers, standing with our educators, improving the quality of education for everyone across the state so that we can go forward in a positive way. That's how our economy is going to grow strong and continue to grow. Christine? As a teacher, I've lived this, and I've watched as my students have lived this. Look around and see how close you are to the people next to you. Now imagine that this is 37 freshmen. Last year it was 39, this year it's 37, and I count myself lucky that it's 37, but freshmen all crammed together. I've watched as this has gone on, and yes, we absolutely need more funding and know what was done is not enough. I do not ever want to have another student come to me and ask if kids in Arizona are worth less than kids in other states because he recognizes the funding issue. I don't think that, that a junior in high school should even be thinking such thoughts. So yes, we definitely need more funding and no, it was not enough. Right. Kate, do you have anything to add, 30 seconds? I do. There is a huge difference between partisanship and leadership and labeling a problem by the letter after an individual's name. I am the education champion. I've been in the Senate and I have been labeled that by many organizations I am not part of the problem, I am part of the solution. It is confusing to me why, given opportunity to after opportunity over the last two years to vote yes on more money for education, individuals on this dais choose to vote no time and time again. I actually wanna take a, a quick sidebar here to address that, um, specifically with the the elected officials who were incumbents who, who had a chance to vote on the state budget this year, um, which at least in, in the first year of the governor's vowed plan did increase funding um, for teacher pay by an average of about 10%. Um, and I'd like to give everybody who was in office at that time an opportunity to explain that vote a, a minute each. We'll start with you, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, yes, you know, I. Red for Ed brought 60, 70,000 teachers down to the Capitol and they were outside on the sidewalk, it was hot. I was inside the building and I felt like I was the voice for those teachers outside, they were outside. And I did not vote for the 20 by 2020 plan for a number of reasons. I feel like it was it's a house of cards. It was built on economic projections that are way too rosy. If there is one hiccup in the economy, that money can just go away. And we were promising teachers that they would could, should go back to the classroom and that this money would be there. 
Um, the money, re the money relied, on, relied on sweeps of funds from areas of the budget that are really important, like healthcare and environmental safety. So I wasn't okay with taking money away from important areas, even though our teachers are a, a huge need. And you know, further, I kept hearing colleagues saying that it was guaranteed. It is, this money is not guaranteed in the future. What was guaranteed was what was in this budget. I was in a meeting just this summer with some Republican colleagues, and we were hearing about budget deficits and public safety, and one of those Republicans said, you know what, we should just take the money back from the teachers. And that was met with a lot of uh, nods of approval from other Republican colleagues. So I think what we need to do is change the majority party and make sure that we protect this money for our teachers. Thank you, Maria. You can take that money from the teachers from my cold, dead hands. It's not happening. Uh, the truth of the matter is revenue is up. I just got the most recent numbers uh, in the budget. It is 7.5%, much more, hundreds of millions of dollars more than originally projected. So the money is there for the teachers. We've increased our jobs over the last three years, 150,000 new jobs in Arizona because of we're doing the right things for the economy and that's growing our budget, growing our revenues, and enabling us to make good on this money for our teachers, 10% this year. It's already being realized in LD28. And the bottom line is, the, none of the Democrats in the House voted with our teachers for the 20% raise. They are all good. The four senators, in the four senators, Democrat senators who voted for our teachers, they're all good too voted for the 20% raise, but everybody else who voted against it on the Democrat side in the House, they're good. So explain that to me. I'm bad because I voted for a 20% raise, but the four senators who voted for the 20% raise are good. It doesn't make any sense. We're putting politics over people, politics over all our right, teachers. Right. Thank you, Maria. Um, Kate. The Red for Ed movement, <laughs> I, I had hoped for the cavalry, we got an army, and I could not be more grateful because it amplified the voices of me and my of mine and my Republican colleagues who have felt been crying for more funding for education for so many years. We had gotten some funding, we'd gotten quite a bit. This year we got a half a billion dollars. It's and still it wasn't a good enough package for some of my colleagues to vote for. Quick point, the dollars that went in to the budget, 2020 and the capital, 100 million front-loaded capital assist, uh, assistance, that has Prop 301 protected. They can't take the money away. They will have to take the money from someplace else, but it's not coming from our teachers. However, going forward, we need sustainable funding for education Hence, my Prop 301 task force, which takes on even more importance given the outcome of Invest in Ed. All right. Thank you for indulging me for a second. We'll get back to asking everyone the same question now. Um, I've got a couple of questions up here about teacher pay, citing reports that, uh, that teachers are leaving Arizona uh, over, the, over their poor pay in favor of states like California and Utah and Nevada, where um, they're offered higher salaries. Um, and, and teacher pay certainly was one of the complaints that we heard from the Red for Ed protests this year. Um, is there something that can be done legislatively to specifically address that issue as far as education funding goes? And we'll start with Aaron. Well, I, I just want to say again, just on this last point, uh, standing up here after 10 years and being $800 million below where we were 10 years ago is not an accomplishment to pat yourself on the back for. That's just the reality of the numbers that we're dealing with. The way these folks are talking up here, I'd encourage you to start voting for Democrat because that's what we're focused on is not causing the problems in the first place and actually getting to a world-class education system. And we can't now about do it. Aaron, about uh, teacher pay. So, though, and, and it, well, it, it's part and parcel of the whole problem. You know, we have local school boards that decide a lot of these questions specifically to pay. In general, a lot of those school boards awarded a good percentage of the increase to, I if you don't have very much money, you can't pay teachers very much. That's just the reality of it. So when you underfund education, we spend right now less money out of classrooms than almost any other state because we spend less money in aggregate than almost any other state. So teacher pay is part and parcel of an underfunded education system by a group of leaders down at the Capitol who every Republican has voted to support in leadership who have systematically taken away money and now are trying to put a little bit back in and be called heroes. And it just doesn't make sense to me. Kathy. 
Well, I'm pretty sure that everyone's looked and there isn't a money tree down at the state capitol. So we have to deal with the revenues and the income that we have in order to do the very best that we can by our teachers and by our students. More so, that is our product. That is what we need to succeed. So when I was speaking earlier about the funding formula, that is one of those places where we have to be able to lay aside the sacred cows and take a look at what is the responsible way that we should be allocating these funds and are we managed properly when it comes to this education funding formula. It's going to make a big difference and it means everyone coming to the table and laying aside those things that we've become accustomed to and maybe making tough choices on what will advance and be in the best interest of our student achievement. Maria. We can start by the Democrats in the House voting for a 20% raise for our teachers and a $1.5 billion investment in education and for university funding and stop putting politics before people, before teachers, and before our children. 15.5%, that's already been realized in the Washington Elementary School District teacher raise. 12%, Paradise Valley Unified. 10%, Madison Elementary. 12%, Creighton. 10%, Scottsdale Unified. 12.8%. Phoenix Union High with more to come in the following two years. All right, thank you. Christine. So the bottom line is that every vote in favor of a tax cut is a vote against kids. We need to reprioritize the way that we are spending our money right now. Again, I live this. This is my life. I watched this year as one of my former students who was teaching with me walked off the job after school one day because he was not being paid enough. We can't, teachers right now can't make a living on their job. And if they could, we wouldn't have a close to 2,000 vacancy, 2,000 teacher vacancy. And it's not that we don't have enough teachers. We do, folks. We have tens of thousands of certified teachers in this state who can't afford to teach. But yes, we can legislatively solve this. It's going to be a matter, though, of reprioritizing how we are spending our precious tax dollars. Kate. Bipartisanship and working together is how we get it done, and that's how I've gotten it done, time after time after time. I was very pleased when a supermajority in both the House and the Senate stepped up and voted yes on what is labeled a tax increase, the legislative extension of Prop 301 for 20 years, 8.6 cents sales tax, which restored enormous stability to the system and also provided dollars that were being withheld from classrooms and from uh, teachers, put them back in the classroom. The example would be Madison Elementary got $500,000 back into the system to hire counselors and to pay teachers. But again, when we got to the 20% raise, the 20% raise for teachers, thank God there were four Democrat colleagues in the Senate who thought this was a good budget and they voted for it. That's how we get there. Leadership, not partisanship. Kelly. Thank you. Just a little more on, 20, on the 20 by 2020 plan. You know, we, we know we have a teacher crisis. Teachers were leaving in droves from the profession. And what we heard was, was that it was 20%, and then it really turned out that it was 8% more in the first year because they were counting the last 1% from the year before and the 1% that was already promised. I mean, this was oversold. It was told to our teachers that it would be the promise of, of all of this new funding, and it really it didn't feel to me like it was a promise that we for sure could keep. And that's, I'm not going to do that to our teachers. Obviously, I'm a small business owner. If you want to have you know, the best quality employees, if you want to have the best, um, hire the best people, you need to pay market rate. And it is that simple. We are not paying our teachers a market rate, and our education system is suffering for it. Aaron, yeah, 30 seconds. I, I just want to say I, it's hilarious to me when they call this the governor's plan. His plan introduced in January was a 1% raise, which is exactly what he did the year before. 
The reality is until there's a crisis that forces action, the Republicans consistently have not addressed this issue. We know what the governor wanted to do. He had a press conference and said, I want to give a 1% raise for the teachers, and that's everyone said, oh great, another 1% raise, I'll buy another cup of coffee this week. The reality is when 60,000 teachers went down to the state house, suddenly there was money to do it and to reprioritize and change. And so I'm very glad that the teachers got that money, of course we all are, but we need leadership that's going to proactively invest in our schools and not wait till there's a crisis before they respond again and again and again. Kathy, real quick. The plan was developed before the teachers came down. And it was, the, the, it, was, it, was it was great for the teachers. And I, no, Excuse no, no, me, they, please, they, please. They, the governor had introduced that opportunity right at the very same time when this was going on. So you can't say that only at that point, because I think that's unfair. But the, the thing is, is at the very end of the day, who voted for it? Who voted for teacher pay? Who voted for those increases? It was Republicans. And that is what we need to keep our eye on the ball. It's not, it's politics to say, oh, I'm not voting for it because it just wasn't enough. You didn't vote for it. You did not vote to support teachers. End of conversation. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Um, let's get on to another question still about uh, school funding. Certainly, this is a hot topic. Um, there was a little bit of discussion about the way schools are funded. Um, I, I heard it briefly mentioned by Aaron earlier, and it, it was certainly something that's been a discussion at the legislature. You know, state funding is provided to schools, and then school districts have the opportunity to decide how those dollars are best spent, be it in the classroom, be it on maintenance, uh, textbooks, whatever is needed. Um, does that need shaking up? Does the legislature need more control over what's happening at local schools? We'll start with you, Kathy. Well, certainly local school districts are where the money goes and where people truly parents out there ought to be paying very close attention to what is going on in your school districts and asking these questions of what percentage of these funds are being for staff, what part of it is administration, what part goes into the classroom, what part is for teachers. Those are important questions. And what happens is, is that you know it, it gets highlighted as to where it starts, which is the state legislature. The governor, no matter who it's been, has never signed a pe teacher paycheck. It has come from your school district. And I I'm certainly am not one that would like to drill down into school districts and tell them exactly how to do their job. That's really why you elect them at the local level so that you elect the best possible leaders for that opportunity. And I just think that parents and those of us that are engaged here, of course, need to go back to those school districts and hold them accountable for how they're spending the dollars that they receive. Maria. Thank you. I think that is one of the great things that happened as a result of Red for Ed. Parents are awake and they're looking at their local school boards and wanting to know where is this money going. In LD28, we had quite the scandal at Scottsdale Unified School District this year with a dozen indictments by the Attorney General for fraud and abuse of taxpayer dollars. I want parents to go down to their school boards just like they're going down to the State House and pay attention to who they're electing and find out where the money is going. Representative Carter is here tonight and uh, we've had extensive discussions about creating more transparency for parents and managed to get some of that in the budget. When I first looked as a mom of a public school student, when you go on the website, it might as well be hieroglyphics with, these, with, with what they put on there. You can't figure out where the money is going. And so we're working together in a bipartisan way in order to create more transparency so parents know where the money is going so that they can go to their school boards, their superintendents, and, know, and ask them and hold them accountable as well. Christine. So the question is, should the legislature have more control over how money is spent? Is that what the actual question is? The, no, absolutely not. Um, it's easy to question when there's a shortage of money like that they're misspending it. But the fact is, is there's really not a whole lot to misspend. Yes, there are, there are isolated scandals. I mean, that's going to happen no matter what in any business. But for the most part, schools are so underfunded that trying to 
piecemeal and trying to dictate how they spend those few dollars to me is just laughable. If there's money for teachers, most school districts are giving the money to teachers. And if they're not, then they're fixing some broken, you know, air conditioner or ceiling or desks or whatever might be, whatever other crisis there is. And that's the problem. Schools are going from one crisis to another because we lack adequate funding to begin with. Kate. I served on the Washington Elementary School Board for 10 years, and I am a huge proponent of local control, and nothing the state can or would do is going to convince me of anything else. All of that being said, it is absolutely critical that the local base of that school district or hold those governing board members accountable. Uh, I met with countless Red for Ed teachers and parents and students because they had open office hours throughout that entire time and learned a lot from them about the differences in their district structures. And some districts uh, are, they just allocate their funds differently. But my thought is you can simplify the funding formula, eliminate for schools, district schools, eliminate a lot of the silos where the funds get stuck and you need them but you can't get to them because they're for something else. And all the superintendents I've talked to said they need that flexibility and then you revise the formula to reflect the classrooms of today, and then you fund it, which is what I'm doing with my Prop 301 task force. Kelly. Thank you. Um, local control is so important. I think that, that the ability of a citizen to go access their, their locally elected official and, and have their voice heard is really important, and it's important for school boards and for the state legislature. But I, you know, we hear a lot of times, oh, the district administrators are, are misusing the money. And I can't tell you, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the schools in my district, and I will tell you, there is no money to misspend. Um, they are, you know, down to the bone. And, you know, I, I, it just, it's a way of, of vilifying and dividing us to make us sound like there's, you know, something going on that, that isn't right. And I think that our district schools are working very hard to efficiently and effectively use the money. I am really worried about transparency of charter schools and their misuse of our public tax dollars. We need to have better oversight of every single use of our tax dollars. Um, and we have been really unable to, to pass any legislation at the legislature to provide better oversight in, in the charter school arena. Thank you. Aaron. I think there's some bipartisan agreement right here on this question of school boards. I think everyone thinks it's, you know, usually things work better when it's locally controlled and that's where you can hold people accountable for the results. But I just want to pick up on what Kelly said about charter schools. Um, I think there's a role for charters to play in offering options to parents, and I think that's an important role. The fact that there has been zero accountability and then people today are waking up and saying, oh my gosh, look at all these horrible things that are being done. None of the bad things that are being done in charters right now are illegal. And the reason is there's almost no oversight provided by the state. There were 13 bills proposed in Kate's Senate Education Committee for more charter school accountability. Not a single one got a hearing or any attention in the light of day. I mean, for, there have been repeatedly, year after year, bills introduced to say, let's look at how our taxpayer dollars are being spent. It's a big part of our education sector at this point, and there's been zero action. And I, I just think that's a perfect example of we need to be more invested in what's happening to our tax dollars and that it's good for all of the citizens and kids in Arizona than in protecting the interests of private charter school owners. I, I don't get for the life of me why we'd be more invested in letting people cover up how they're spending our taxpayer dollar than in actually getting important student outcomes for kids. Kate, 30 seconds to respond to that. Thank you. Just very quickly, we passed legislation last year that went through my Senate Education Committee uh, that included or beefed up the charter schools, charter school boards, the State Board of Charter Schools ability to shut down charter schools. They could shut, shut it down for academic and now they can shut it down for financial and operational reasons. So that wasn't an accurate statement. All right. And actually, um, Aaron, your last question kind of jumped the gun on my, or your last answer jumped the gun on my next question. Um, I did want to talk about some of the recent reporting um, by the Arizona Republic about um, how charter schools are using the uh, dollars that they're provided from the state. Um, and, and even just this week, we had an announcement from the Attorney General, Mark Brnovich, calling for legislation to, uh, to beef up oversight of charter school finances. Um, we'll start with you, Maria. What do you think of, of uh, 
primavera of the calls for uh, more oversight, what can be done um, to, to distinguish oversight of charters, uh, perhaps more closely to the way that, they, that public schools are overseen? Thank you. Uh, yes, and just to echo what Senator Brophy McGee said, she is quite correct that we did uh, include further oversight and can shut down charter schools for financial malfeasance. And there is a charter school board and the ultimate oversight is revoking their charter. And we probably do need to take a look at that board and what their powers are. And I, am, I appreciate the Attorney General. I haven't had a conversation with Attorney General Brnovich yet about the details of his plan, but I did read the article. And I agree with him that this needs to be looked at. When you have a situation like Primavera where there are huge profits and zero performance and there is no uh, uh, accountability for that, I think that's a real problem. And I think that that is something that we can move forward with on a bipartisan basis to come up with solutions. Christine. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, charter schools were supposed to be a petri dish for innovation. And the whole point was that they would, in a very small environment, create new innovative teaching techniques to then expand out to society. That's not the way they are functioning in Arizona, at least not most of them. In Arizona, um, too often, it's about making money on the backs of our kids. So the question is, do they need more accountability? Absolutely. Charter schools, from a financial point of view, should be functioning pretty much the same way that a district public school is functioning. It is, to me, unconscionable that people are actually getting rich off of our kids. Kate. It's sort of a good news, bad news. Transparency and increased oversight is what has led to these revelations that are so outrageous regarding uh, Primavera and this one charter school. Um, I can tell you that the, I support the Attorney General's recommendations and I think we need to continue to level the spotlight on charter schools in terms of, and level the playing field between charter schools and public schools. I advocate all day long that we reward our district schools when my colleagues may want to punish them for the actions of one or two bad actors. I feel the same way about charter schools. There are good actors out there who are doing a good job of educating kids, and I know it's a choice in my district that parents really value. So I would argue that it needs a more oversight, it needs leadership, not partisanship, and I'm very concerned, depending on how far the pendulum swings, that this choice may actually be shut down. I think we can get to where we need to be in overseeing charter schools, and we also need to back it off on the, on the district schools. Kelly. Thank you. Um, to be clear, I, I support parents making the right choice for their children, but as a lawmaker, we need to make sure that all of those choices are good choices and they're accountable choices. Um, we've seen charter schools not only just going out of business, we have charter schools that are failing their students academically, and the charter board knows that. They can't close a charter school for failure to actually teach their students. They only have, we gave them a tiny bit of a new, uh, this new bill that we passed gave them a tiny bit of authority to possibly close them for financial mismanagement, although we know many of them still have red flags in their financial mismanagement. But back to the, you know, my colleagues on my side of the aisle have been introducing legislation for years before millions and millions of dollars has just gone out the window as these car charter schools have gone bankrupt. Um, just this session, there were at least 10 bills that were going through the Senate Education Committee and were providing opportunities to do things like procurement codes that match district schools, conflict of interest laws, and oversight and reporting of the profits being made by charter schools. So there were some really good ideas on both sides of the aisle. Unfortunately, only one side of the aisle has been able to, to get their bills heard in, that, in this arena, and we need to change that because this needs to be bipartisan. We need to fix this and make sure that our school, all of our schools are accountable. Aaron, you kind of already answered this one, but anything else? I've got a little bit more to say on this one. <laughs> the, uh, the, the reality is even before the small tweaks on financial accountability, if you could read the balance sheet posted online three years ago, the majority of the for-profit charters had negative equity on their balance sheet. That means they're losing money every single year, and then they're going to go out of business and hand the taxpayers you know, a, a, 
the, the, the problem and make people clean it up. Literally, charter schools closing on Friday for Monday classes. This has been going on for years, and I, I'm, I'm sitting here hearing about these calls for bipartisanship when there have been Democratic bills and no one willing to work on this issue when we've known it's a problem. Is it Rumpelstiltskin who is like asleep for 100 years and then wakes up, right? That's what I feel like is going on. Like, we've known that there's issues with charter school accounting for a decade. We've seen these again and again and again. It's the same problem that we've talked about previously, which is until there's a crisis or a front page Arizona Republic story, there's no one willing to work across the aisle to actually hold people accountable for the money that's spent on behalf of kids. That's what we need to change. We need to put Arizona first over party, and we need to put our kids first over party to start making sure we're doing all we can for the children and families of this state. Kathy? I believe one of the efforts in making Arizona's kids first is offering those different types of choice. We're lucky in LD28 that some of the best public schools, the best private schools, and even some of the best higher performing charter schools happen to be in this legislative district. So what we're looking at is taxpayer accountability when it comes to these egregious things that do happen like a primavera. I walk every single day in this district and knock doors. On Friday, or excuse me, on Sunday and Monday when I was knocking, this was the hot topic. And everybody wants to know what you're going to do and what we're going to do when we're down there to help fix these problems. And accountability of these fiscal issues makes a big impact, not only to us and our, and our budgets and how we utilize our funds, but also to the public. The other thing we need to hold them accountable to is, is education performance. As long as we're going to hold them accountable for financial performance, that needs to be accountability to their education for the students of this district and others. Maria, do you have, uh, you have 30 seconds for any final thoughts? Thank you. Politics before people. I wish there was a, as much passion generated. The school district, Scottsdale Unified School District, wasn't even mentioned in terms of the corruption and the indictments that are going on here by my fellow members of the dais. But Primavera is an indication of a widespread problem. The bottom line is our charter schools, especially in LD28, as Ms. Petz has said, are working. NAEP scores are at the top in the country. Uh, we consistently rank in top five in the country charter schools in Arizona. Uh, does there have to be more oversight? Yes. Do we have to make sure performance is occurring with these charter schools? Yes. And we have to go forward in a bipartisan way where we put our people, our students before politics. All right, we're going to shift gears away from education for a moment. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions today very broadly about uh, what kind of water policy changes Arizona needs. That was something that was um, on the radar legislatively this year. The governor had uh, pushed for certain reforms. Um, there was some pushback from the legislature, and, and, and nothing really came to pass on that. But um, at least everyone who sent me a question seems to, to understand that um, there are shortages and an increasing shortage. Um, so broadly, what might you propose to do to resolve that crisis and, and hopefully avert a water shortage in the future? We'll start with you, Christine. Okay, can I um, reply, respond to something that was previously said very briefly? We'll, we'll get back to that at another time. Let's focus okay. on water right now. So obviously this is uh, reaching crisis proportions. And we need to bring in the experts, all the experts in the field, everybody together. This is going to be a, have to be a truly bipartisan effort to solve this water issue that we have in front of us right now. Um, obviously, there have been steps that have been made already. Um, we've already got um, the district board that's working on this. The, I'm sorry, the Central Arizona Water Conservation District Board is working on this right now. Um, I am fortunate that one of them is my former student, and if elected, that is going to be the first person that I sit down and have a meeting with to talk to the true experts. I will not be talking to lobbyists or special interest groups about this, but the true experts to get a handle on at least getting somewhat on top of this very complicated and very um, frightening crisis that we face. Kate. So I tell everybody the water legislation last session was a bad news, good news thing, situation. The bad news is we got nothing done about water. The good news is we got nothing done about water. But that 
whole process fell apart during session and it has been reconstituted. There actually is already a bipartisan group of warring uh, water interests who are coming together for the greater good. Arizona has been a leader in setting water policy. Uh, the group's first job is to figure out uh, sustainable uh, water legislation uh, for the competing interests that re result in a negotiated settlement that everybody can live with. That has to happen in order for this policy to work. The very first thing we must address is the drought uh, contingency plan, and I think other Western states are looking at us to do that. That's the very first order of business. I'm glad to see that the Central Arizona Project and the Department of Water Resources have put aside their governing I issues and their sovereign immunity issues uh, because that complicated this issue beyond belief and helped blow it up next session. We must do something this next session. Kelly. Thank you. It is a, a dire issue. Um, I was just talking to one of the CAP board members yesterday and she, she reminded me that Lake Mead is now only two feet above the level that's going to trigger automatic and mandatory cutbacks, only two feet, and that is expected to occur, and we will, we're expected to hit that threshold at 2020. So what we need to be doing now is asking those experts to come up with a drought contingency plan immediately. Um, and, and I think that the, those, those meetings are ongoing, so we, we need to have those meetings and that plan put in place now, and then we need to have the experts at the table for the long-term plan that incorporates you know, the needs of the entire region beyond just Arizona. Um, we saw at the legislature a few things that were really troubling about the partisanship that was being um, kind of applied to this water. We saw this water issues. We saw that the governor was trying to make some moves to potentially make a more partisan process. And I'm very concerned about that and will be on the lookout for that because that is, you know, anyone, as anyone knows, a water policy needs to stand the test of time. There's nothing more important and we can't have it be a partisan issue at all. Aaron. I'm not as polite as Christine, and I just have to say that when the districts were going to be held responsible and the legislature voted to have new procurement rules, at the last minute there was an amendment supported by and passed by the majority to exempt the charter Aaron, schools. That tells you all you Aaron, know. we're talking about right, water about at this water. point. Thank you. This is a perfect example where we need to make decisions based on being Arizonans, not Democrats and not Republicans. And the last time this got done, again, it was a Democratic governor, Bruce Babbitt, and Burton Barr, who was in this district, the majority leader for the Republicans, Every Sunday, Bruce Babbitt would go to Burton Barr's house. He, Bruce Babbitt would pick up the newspaper off the, the driveway. He'd hand it to him. Mr. Barr would give him a cup of coffee. They'd sit down and plan out what they were going to do together. The Groundwater Management Act that they passed had a 100-year time horizon on it. Literally required new developers to certify they had water for 100 years. It's that type of foresight that we need now right down at the Capitol. And I think one of the great challenges is that happened because that wasn't the first thing they tackled together. That was the 51st thing they tackled together. And we need to get back to being able to work Democrat and Republicans on issues like this because particularly for water and particularly for the state, it's so important that we get it right and that we take a much longer term time horizon than we've typically seen. Kathy. Well, every issue should be an Arizona issue. It's not just this issue. And I will tell you that I believe that water is the most important issue that we're facing. You know, if, if you can't keep it alive, we're not gonna thrive. So you know, we can have the best schools, we can have a thriving economy. We don't have the proper water resources and the proper management and responsible growth to manage the water that we have. You know, kiss it all goodbye. The c drought contingency plan is something that is being widely discussed regarding the supply and the demand of what is going on with the Colorado River. All the southern, the they call the lower basin states are meeting regularly and I actually think that there will probably be a solution probably before we even start the state, the um, when we start the, the legislative session in January, which is a really good news and that is something that should be something that we are proud of that is getting done even when we are in the middle of a general general election on election year. And that's happening with lots of different people at the table. Maria. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so when I came into the legislature, water was obviously one of the issues on the front burner. And I had multiple meetings with stakeholders. Uh, we're very fortunate in Arizona. Yes, we are a leader. We are an example to the rest of the world, really, not just the country on conservation and have some of the best uh, foresight in terms of, of conservation. Uh, I had meetings with uh, Senator Kyle and his team um, 
regarding some of the low-hanging low fruit that we thought we could get past. It was disappointing that, that uh, we couldn't do it um, with, the, with the things that seemed more obvious and we're taking a more global approach. But I agree with most of the things that have been said here tonight. Uh, the only thing that I would add is that uh, we need to have a bipartisan effort that, um, that recognizes the unique needs of rural and urban uh, living. Thank you. Uh, Christine, 30 seconds for any final thoughts. Yeah, I just, I, this whole thing puzzles me because this is just another example of a crisis happening, a crisis having to happen before there's any action taken. Why was this 100-year plan not extended out? I mean, we should be always looking 100 years into the future and not to just the next week or the next year or the next month or, or whatever. So um, that, I have nothing else. All right, <laughs> all right. Um, next question is a, a community concern. Um, we've gotten a couple questions about short-term rentals in uh, LD28 neighborhoods, um, kind of a sharing economy question, if you will. Um, there's concerns about the impact that it's having on the neighborhoods and I'm just curious, you know, with the, at least the last four years, a governor who's been very reticent to, to regulate in any way the sharing economy, um, is there something that, that the legislature could do um, to weigh in on that issue? We'll start with you, Kate. Thank you for the question. There is something that is being done um, during my interim work. Um, and the roadmap was actually set by the legislation that I sponsored and, and, managed, and managed through the legislative process, working closely with the governor's office, regulating sober living homes. So people saw that I did that and came and talked to me about Airbnbs because they also need to be regulated. That This is part of the neighborhood safety work that I do, and I am working with uh, an unlikely person, <laughs> Senator John Kavanaugh, to author legislation that will, in fact, regulate Airbnbs and restore the peace and calm in our neighborhoods. Another issue that I'm working on that's tangentially related is regulating treatment facilities that are located in neighborhoods. We have a huge methadone clinic over at 23rd Avenue and Northern that is disrupting the neighborhood um, and the patients are being preyed upon and victimized as are the neighbors. And so that's another issue that I work on during the interim um, and it's all part and parcel of keeping our neighborhoods safe and livable. Kelly? Thank you. Um, it, it, it's a big issue, these, this, the thought of you know, people renting out their homes and, and disrupting the neighbor and the, and the culture of the neighborhood and doing that. Um, so we do need to have thoughtful discussion about what, what is acceptable because at the same time we have people who are relying on that revenue or, you know, and, and looking for that because they need more revenue to live their lives. So it, it's a balancing act and we need to be thoughtful when we're, we're making those choices. You know, I, I too have been able to work with the city um, in trying to, to call attention to problems that are erupting in different neighborhoods and that's been a really rewarding part of my work. But um, there's, there is a need for some thoughtful reform but it's gonna be really tricky because we do have to balance the needs of people who are you know, owning those homes with people that want to, to rent them and their neighbors and their safety and security. So it's, it, it's gonna be a tough issue and, and something we need to continue to work on. Aaron. I mean, to me, this starts with a public safety issue that should be dealt with regardless of who's in the house. If they're violating the noise ordinances, if they're doing things that aren't safe for neighbors, we need our um, police to be able to have the uh, ability to intervene and make sure that our neighborhoods are safe. I mean, that's just a basic thing regardless of who's there. This is a tough one. Um, legislation is a blunt instrument, and people have, for many people, the biggest asset they have is their house. And so I think we need to proceed cautiously to, before we put too much regulation on how that works. But we've got to have our neighbors and our we've got to have our neighborhoods that are safe, um, safe for our kids, safe for our families. And honestly, I think the biggest issue specific to the Airbnbs is the noise. I think in terms of the sober living homes and things like that, it's another really tough issue. We all want to make sure that we have the best possible care in the most appropriate setting for um, our citizens in that sort of desperate need. At the same time, we have to make sure that our children and our families are safe wherever they live too. So a lot of these issues are balancing act and um, I have a little bit of caution around the ability of legislation to get it exactly right, but certainly something that, to look into more. Kathy. It does seem silly that we would need to legislate how to be a good neighbor. And I live next to a home that is rented out for church 
events and weddings and other things. And it becomes a problem when it comes to if, you know, we're having an event and all of a sudden there's lack of parking around the neighborhood. So it is an issue that does affect individuals and their quality of life. And I think that that is something that we do have to take a look at and see what is the best result and the, re the best solution to achieve the type of neighborhood um, safety, the type of neighborhood environment that we expect in the areas that we live. The opportunities I've had recently to visit with some of our Sunny Slope neighborhoods and others, the Hatcher neighborhood, to see what they are doing to develop safe environments for their communities because they have been um, riddled with you know, drug problems and and vandalism, and it's very exciting to be part of that, and I look forward to being more a part of that as a state legislator here in LD28. Maria. Thank you, if you'd indulge me for a moment, this discussion is reminding me of a funny story that Senator McCain used to tell when he was meeting with constituents. He'd tell the story of uh, a little old lady who used to call him and say, oh, the neighbors are making so much noise next to my house, and, uh, uh, he would say, well, you should call your mayor, and, and she'd say, oh, no, he's way too busy. <laughs> um, as, a, as a former town councilwoman and as a planning commissioner uh, in Paradise Valley, we dealt with the noise and public safety issues. I pioneered the Advisory Committee on Public Safety. Um, I've, I've dealt with this issue. It is a tough issue, but as long as we equip our citizens with the tools to be able to report the problems to their police officers and we have the capacity and we're funding our police officers uh, so they can address these issues. I think that's a really good start. Christine. I think part of the issue is what is a neighbor and who belongs there. Like, like we have some kind of ownership over our neighbors. Um, the fact is, is that there's a real need for, say, sober living homes. We need those. We want people to recover from their addictions, and we need to eliminate some of the stigma that is attached with that kind of issue. So part, I mean, I think, it, as Kelly said, this becomes then quite the balancing act um, but I think we could go a long ways in opening up some of this dialogue and opening up the absolute necessity of some of these short-term rental units that, that we're referencing. All right, any final thoughts, Kate, 30 seconds? Very quickly, the purpose of any type of regulation for these homes is to sort out the scam artists and the bad actors from the real really good operators. Uh, if you've got a sober living home or an Airbnb that's being properly utilized, you don't know that it's there. So it's the bad guys that are coming in and taking advantage of for sale homes in Paradise Valley. One of the things that I am most grateful is during my tenure at the legislature, I have developed wonderful working relationships with all the Phoenix City Council members, with the Paradise Valley Council members, with Scottsdale Council members, and with the county supervisors. And we work together collectively on a nonpartisan and bipartisan basis on issues like this that are so important to our constituents. All right, thank you. Um, we're now gonna shift gears to, as I mentioned, the second portion of the debate where there's an opportunity for folks to ask specific questions of candidates. Um, I'll remind you, if you do want to, to ask a question, just write the candidate's name on the note card. Um, they'll get me the card and we'll see if we have time to ask them. Um, we'll get started with, uh, let's see. We'll get started with. Whew, we'll get started with Kathy. A um, couple questions about your questionnaire that you filled out in the Arizona Republic. Just a candidate information questionnaire. Um, it said that a part of your answer on uh, firearm safety had to do with support for universal background checks, um, and that you stated that reasonable security-minded individuals are the ones who should be able to, to purchase firearms. I want to take two minutes, if you would, if you could elaborate on that answer and, and explain um, what you think universal background checks should be implemented like. First, we have many laws on the books regarding gun laws, and so we do need to take a look at all of those when we're taking, considering what is out there. 
I see that that was very humorous to you. I'm glad that that caught your, your fancy. But it's not funny. Uh, when people are talking to you about their children, they are talking to you about the most important thing in their lives. And I think that that's one reason why we are looking at what gun laws are, because it's become very personal, and it's become something that people are concerned about when it comes to their children in schools. Part of the universal background check that I believe is important is our mental health. And that is a portion of, of background checks that I don't think is foolish or um, something that we should take lightly. It's something that is necessary. Individuals, if they have mental health issues, should be identified and helped for those issues. They should not be allowed to have guns. I, right. That's it. Does anyone <laughs> else have uh, something to add to that discussion? Okay, no. Um, we'll move on to the next one then. Christine, this question is for you. Um, you're a former Arizona Teacher of the Year, um, so certainly you have uh, a lot of background in the classroom. Um, that is not the only issue that uh, a senator from LD28 will face when they get to the Capitol. So how do you plan on, on getting up to speed on the numerous issues you'll be asked to vote on um, and, and anything else you might not have uh, ample expertise in right out of the gate? The, one of the strengths of teachers is that we are lifelong learners and we share, we, I have a filing cabinet that I bring in any brand new teacher and I show the filing cabinet to him or her and I say, go in there, take anything you want. We are all like that. That's what good teaching is and that is that ability to ask for help and to also give help is how I will be filling in the gaps that may or may not be missing. I'm not, I mean, that may or may not be missing as I head into the legislature. I have no question on my ability to find the experts in whatever field I might need to get information about um, and it won't be special interest groups, it's going to be the true experts. So I'm actually very, very confident in that aspect of my future uh, time in the legislature. All right. Kathy. You know what, there's something I do want to say regarding the question that was asked of me is, the Second Amendment is something I do think is important. I, we have gamesmen in our family and that is something that is a sport and is something that people have activity with. This does not mean that when you take a look at how you are planning to look at gun laws that you are against the Second Amendment. I think it's very much wanting to be pro-Second Amendment because you want those individuals who are security minded, those people who value the life of all those around them that, that they understand that that's the importance of it. And so I just wanted to offer that. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, our next question is uh, for Maria, but I also would like uh, Kathy and Kate to weigh in on this if you don't mind. Um, there's been a lot of reporting that's indicated there has been some infighting amongst the Republican candidates this year, um, particularly uh, reporting that maybe suggested or hinted at that uh, Maria, your husband was running as an independent candidate, perhaps to, to cause trouble for Kate, um, that Kathy is running to perhaps cause trouble for you and your reelection bid. Um, I'd, like, I'd like you to address those uh, re reports, re speculation, what have you, and um, I know there's been a lot of talk about working across the aisle, but there's concern from a couple of folks who, who sent in questions about just Republicans being able to work with one another in LD28. Could you address that? Thank you. I think just like with the Democratic Party, there are differing views within the Republican Party on policy issues, and we represent a wide uh, range of people. I think that, uh, first of all, let me just say, my husband is the most honorable man I know, and I love him dearly, and he's a wonderful man uh, who's dedicated himself to this community and healing people in, in service to, to uh, helping people and saving their lives. 
but uh, as far as concerns, uh, there's a lot of hyperbole in the media. Everyone loves a great headline. Um, and I think that uh, the voters are smarter than that and they care about the issues. And that's what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the successes I've had, the things I've delivered on, success in my legislation helping women, veterans, public safety, uh, strengthening our, enacting Pam's law where we strengthened our penalties for DUI offenders who uh, got off with a slap on the wrist after killing uh, uh, Pam and inju seriously injuring her small children. Um, I care about uh, veterans and helping them transition to the workforce. So I'm focusing on that. I know my colleagues um, in the Republican caucus are also very focused on their um, agenda and the issues that are important to the constituents that they represent. And we certainly have found areas that we do f have common ground on. All right, thank you. And Kathy, is, uh, is everything okay between the Republican candidates here? <laughs> the practical part of politics is decency, first and foremost. I have been in the Republican Party all my life. All my life, I have helped other Republicans and causes to be elected. That has always been my desire. And in our party and in this legislative district, I'm gonna be the, the person here who's gonna do numbers on you, 54,000 Republicans live in this district, 48,000 independents, 42,000 Democrats. It's logical that you would have three candidates from the Republican Party run for the three seats. I met with Maria and Kate to discuss this as we had discussed through the state party that we would have three candidates link arms, join together, go forward, and win three seats in this party, in this district, because that is something that used to happen in this legislative district. We had Burton Barr, Jane Hull, uh, Leo Corbett, many fine leaders who were people that you went to to solve issues. And that is what we needed. We needed productive people, three productive people who can get things done. My apologies, Kelly, but in the minority party, you have not been able to get things done. So I approached this with Maria, and what was met. Excuse me, excuse me. She, I, it, 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 is, it is true, Maria has gotten several things done. Kate has been extremely productive. However, when this opportunity to join together was broached, a week later, Maria's husband changed parties, became an independent, went through the charade of a first class Ford fraudery scheme to be on the ballot, which has cost Kate Brophy McGee $60,000 in legal fees. I wanted to work together. I worked, met with you twice, and this isn't what you wanted, and I am sorry for that because our party deserved it, and this district deserves productive people. I ask for your vote. Kate? So my name is Kate Brophy McGee, and I'm running for the Senate. <laughs> please, everyone, please. Everyone, I'll remind you, this is being recorded, particularly for post-captioning surfaces, so please keep it down. Thank you. May I have my time back? Yes. In case I need it. Um, I am focused on my race, in all seriousness. I am focused on my race. I am focused on results. I'm focused on bipartisan solutions. Um, and I'm enjoying working and walking and knocking with uh, Kathy. She has dragged me over every part of this district three times, and I'm sure we'll make it three more times. I've met some wonderful, wonderful people. So thank you, all of those who opened when I knocked on your doors. This district is pretty smart. Voters are pretty, really smart. They'll figure it out, and they'll figure out who belongs in office. Um, and I always give it over to them. I do the best I can, and then it's up to the voters. I guess the last thing would be to talk about my go-to bill when things get pretty dark and I go, why in the heck am I doing this? What am I thinking? And I think about my breast cancer treatment bill, which I passed in 2012. It, in, it enabled women who are uninsured or underinsured to get coverage for and treatment for breast cancers. 
uh, breast and cervical cancer, and I worked with a Democrat. There's that old bipartisan thing again. Crossed the aisle, and we got it done, and we changed Arizona's options so women could get that treatment. And going back to 2012, I called the um, Arizona cancer guy and said, what's, what's the count up to? 450 women and one man have received treatment with this bill. So that's why I do this. I do this to do good. I get good things done. I'm effective, and I want to go down there and work with people who will do the same bipartisan. Maria, 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, every bill that I have sponsored and passed have been bipartisan, many of them unanimous, uh, which Senator Brophy McGee has also voted for and supported, and which Kelly Butler has also voted for and supported. That's why I go down to the legislature. I've had tremendous success with impactful legislation that helps people every day. Um, politics can be an ugly business. It attracts all sorts of people. And uh, I think that the only thing I would add is that uh, uh, in this proceeding, in this, uh, this <laughs> uh, political stew, um, the court said that uh, my husband, Dr. Sims, uh, had nothing to do with any kind of forgery or fraud. That is a legal decision that stands. The court actually went out of its way to say that. Um, and I wish that people would call for the prosecution of the wrongdoers as much as they want to rake someone over the coals who simply wants to join the democratic process. All right, thank you. Another question. Kelly, yes. Um, it was because it was said that politics is a, I think, a dirty business or a nasty business. It doesn't have to be. Uh, we can elect people that, that care more about our voters and care more about finding solutions for people in our district and in our state than about this argument of whatever is going on up here. Um, you know what, Christine Marsh and Aaron Lieberman and I are very focused on solutions that are going to help families in Arizona, and we're going to keep our eye on that ball. And we have some really good solutions. I'm looking forward to working with them. All right, question for Aaron now as well. Um, like Christine, you would be new to this political process. Um, what kind of uh, experience, expertise, um, what can you bring to the table that, uh, that the folks who are already elected to office here in this district maybe can't? Well, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I think part of what this place gave me growing up was the spirit of you try to make the world as it should be, not as it is. And I spent my career uh, particularly focused on low-income children and families. I was a Head Start teacher when I first graduated from college um, in Boston. I then started a not-for-profit called Jumpstart that puts college students as literacy tutors. 50,000 college students across the country have done Jumpstart over the last 20 years. I then started a company and moved to Harlem and started a company, Oscillero Learning, that um, runs Head Start programs. And while it impacts 40,000 kids every day, the thing I'm most proud of is the results that it gets, nearly three times the national average. I think the through line through all of that is just figuring out how to make things work better. And I think my view is we need a lot of that in the state right now. Um, practical solutions that are actually going to make things work better, because we've got a lot of things that aren't working right now. And that's what I bring down to the legislature. Another question for Maria. Um, what is the first bill you would plan on sponsoring if reelected and serving in 2019? Um, I think that the thing that I'm very passionate about is school safety. Obviously, I have children who have attended and one who's currently attending um, public school in LD28. And uh, given my law enforcement background, I've been part of the bipartisan discussions in the legislature and with the governor's office on how we can tackle um, the school safety issues and reduce the likelihood of uh, gun violence in our schools. Um, we had very robust discussions, but with a very full agenda this year on education and some other issues in the Opioid Epidemic Act, which we were able to pass, um, we still have more to do in that area. So I plan on working with leadership and hope to introduce um, legislation that will um, empower our parents, empower our families and our schools um, to increase security and reduce the likelihood of um, a tragedy happening in Arizona. Um, a, a quick follow-up on the specific of the governor's plan, which uh, if Governor Doug Ducey is reelected, he's promised to, to bring this back. There was a part of his school safety plan that would have allowed a method through the courts 
for uh, family members, school leaders, uh, you know, just other folks involved in someone's life to petition the courts to have uh, firearms removed from someone who is deemed a danger to their self and others. Um, is that a part of the plan that, that you would support? Well, there were many aspects to the plan. There were increasing um, school resource officers. There was increasing uh, school um, psychological services, uh, among other things. Uh, certainly, the stop order was probably the most controversial aspect of the, of the proposal. Um, I think that there were uh, details that still need to be worked out. So we would have to have those discussions. Um, hopefully bipartisan discussions where we could come to some agreement as to what those thresholds are. Who should be armed with that ability to be able to report someone? Um, how do you know that somebody is going to be a harm to themselves or others? These are all the details that we need a little bit more time to work on. All right, first Kelly, 30 seconds, and then we'll get to you, Kate. That despite the failure of the school safety plan to go anywhere in the session, which was really disappointing, we did have an opportunity. And uh, my colleagues introduced a bump stock ban on the floor, and we tried to, there was an opportunity, it's, it's a, a technique that you can do to, to introduce a bill. Um, and my colleagues in, in the House with me, uh, every single Republican voted against having a debate on whether or not it was reasonable to ban bump stocks in Arizona. So uh, we could have had a solution this year, and, I, and we had children, this was following the Parkland shooting, we had children in the gallery watching this, and we, the, unfortunately the Republicans in the House chose to make no progress in this area at all. Kate. In answer to your question about the stop order, the severe threat order of protection, my answer is yes, we need that. Um, in regard to the mental health legislation that were an appropriation that was part of that, I was very glad to see that that, in fact, made it into the budget, a budget, unfortunately, uh, four, four of my colleagues in the Senate from the other side of the aisle voted for it, but um, my colleague from the House did not. Um, that made it into the budget, so we have $11 million in appropriated funds for uh, access care for children who are identified as having mental health issues. We need to get those mental health resources into the school, uh, into the schools as soon as we possibly can. This was a good start, and I was disappointed by the no vote. There's a lot more work that needs to be done on school safety. I served on the Washington Elementary School Board. As I've told you, I was also on the School Facilities Board. We did a lot of work around the issues of school safety and things that you can do to make the campuses of the schools much more safe. Any other thoughts on the school safety bill? Honestly, I think a little bit of, the, honestly, the last two questions that we're kind of bumping in here too is, um, we, there are some extreme viewpoints by some people held who are who don't support criminal background checks. I mean, I think that was Maria's response to the Center for Arizona Policy on private gun sales. I think there's some common sense things that can be put in place here that will help move the whole state forward. And to do that, we need moderate leaders who are willing to kind of engage with where the district is. And that hasn't always been the experience of these last couple of years, for sure. All right, Christine. In the essence of time, I was not going to answer on this one, but um, as the only teacher up here, this is one that is um, very near and dear to my heart. And this past school year was the first year where I had students truly afraid and expressing that fear. Um, I mean, maybe they were afraid other years, but this was the first year and, uh, where they actually expressed it. Our kids are frightened. We have to do something. And even if it's something like bringing in more social workers, more psychologists, reduced class size, I mean, all of the school safety issues don't necessarily have to pivot on guns. They certainly can, and maybe they should. But there are a lot of common sense type solutions that would really redu reduce the risk and really do a lot to make our very scared children less afraid. All right. I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, this one is for Kate, but uh, I, I think other folks might want to weigh in as well. Um, there is scheduled to be a vote in November on the ballot on uh, something called the, the Clean Energy Initiative that would require uh, uh, Arizona
Arizona's use of renewable energy to be boosted to 50%. Um, there was, in anticipation of that, uh, a bill that was put through the legislature this year that uh, effectively neutered the penalties for utilities who, who don't meet that goal. Um, you know, there, there's probably going to be uh, litigation about that at some point if uh, voters approve this, but um, Kate, the question was, as one of the Republicans who, who voted for that bill that, you know, took some of the teeth potentially out of the renewable energy standards that are in that clean energy initiative, um, if you could explain that vote um, and, and why that needed to happen before voters had a chance to, to have their say. Well, if, if I understand, it was a vote, not a bill, not an initiative, correct? There was a bill that affected the yes. initiative if it is approved, yes. Yes, and that was existing legislation that already is in statute that was moved to a different part of statute to provide as much flexibility for Arizona in the event this devastating initiative passes. The fact of the matter is it's a devastating initiative. It is guaranteed to raise ev the average Arizona ratepayers bill by $1,900 a year, so goodbye 20% 20, 20 pay raise. It's gonna impact Arizonans. We have people from both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, who have stood up and said, this is not the way to do energy policy. By putting it in the state constitution, when you think how much energy technology has changed, it's unbelievable. Furthermore, it refuses to let uh, Palo Verde Nuclear, it refuses to recognize Palo Verde Nuclear as clean energy, which in fact it is, or as a renewable energy. So it does a lot of things to hamstring our ability to regulate our own energy policies. And it's brought to us by a California billionaire who wants to import California policies here. It's a, it would be a terrible thing to do. Democrats agree, I agree. The legislation that was referenced was not new legislation, it was simply uh, including it in an additional part of the statute. Uh, Democrats, any thoughts? Kelly? Uh, I just, I want to address the, the downplaying um, that uh, Kate just did of the bill that was passed at the legislature. This was a serious bill that told the utilities in Arizona that if they don't meet an energy standard that is required, that all they have to do is pay a tiny fine. This is an end run around voters. It's happened, I want you to pay really close attention to this because we've seen now Invest in Ed was thrown off the ballot. Um, outlaw dirty money has been thrown off the ballot. These are attacks on voters' rights and this was a preemptive attack on your right as a voter to have a voice on this issue. No matter what you think about this issue, it is on the ballot. Voters deserve to have a voice and to have this bill passed and ignore you in advance is unbelievable. I, it, it was so disappointing and, and just extremely, extremely cynical. I think honestly what we just heard up here were like the talking points distributed by APS. And that's just the reality of it, that the legislature has been working for APS instead of working for the people of Arizona. Uh, again, we have the worst pollution of almost any major city in the United States, and we're doing nothing to encourage things that would help with that. We have 300 days of solar, and we don't encourage solar at all. We need common sense solutions of people who are focused on what most Arizonans want, which is a state that works well for everybody, instead of being so concerned about what APS is going to do with their millions of dollars of dirty money. Kate? And Arizonans need to be the one to set those policies, not an out-of-state billionaire. Democrats agree, Chicanos por la causa agrees. Many people have said this is not a good way to do energy policy. When it comes to renewables and clean, I'm all of the above, I believe, is the answer that's given, as are many of my Republican colleagues. But there is a way to get there and implanting this into the Arizona Constitution where it cannot be changed, it cannot be adjusted, it cannot in any way, shape, or form going forward is terrifying. Everybody should be afraid of this approach and this concept. And by the way, the same Supreme Court that threw Invest in Ed off the ballot kept this one on. So maybe it really is an independent judiciary. All right. That's, excuse us, please. All right, that's all the time we have for questions. It's now time for your closing statements. You'll have a minute each. Christine, we'll start with you. Oh, okay. 
First off, uh, thank you for hosting this to the Clean Elections Fund. And thank you, I'm not fund, I'm sorry, Clean Elections Fund. Thank you, um, everybody, for being here as well. Um, the bottom line is that I believe that any society that takes care of their kids is going to be taking care of everybody on up the totem pole, on up through the ages. And uh, right now, we are not doing a very good job of taking care of our kids. I will be an absolute 100% fighter for our children. There can't be a bigger fighter as an actual teacher, as a foster mother. Um, this is something that um, I will be going down and that will be my battle cry, is let's take care of our kids and everybody above that, I believe, will be um, much better off. Our current education system, as we all know, is our future economy. Those are our future oh, doctors and lawyers and presidents. I always think to myself that the future president could be sitting in my class, and that's pretty much the philosophy that runs my life. Kate. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. I can tell you that District 28 voters have that fighter already in the Senate. I am a uniter. I am not a divider. I solve problems. I don't create them. I bring people together instead of tearing them apart. I get things done, and I have the record to prove it. And there are many vulnerable populations in this state who have benefited from my work in the Capitol. I've earned your trust and your vote because I know the issues and because I fight for you every single day. More partisanship is not the solution. Both Republicans and Democrats have solutions. What really works is to put them together, and that's what I do. I focus on education, neighborhoods, children and family, healthcare and small businesses. On November 6th, vote Kate. Kelly. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for sitting through this tonight. Um, it's been a great opportunity to talk about some really important things that are going on in our district. And, you know, as we see all too divisive politics kind of taking over, I think we need to focus on what's important and we need to focus on solutions for Arizona. I am, I have, it's been an honor to serve in my first term and I was focused on education funding and I was focused on being the voice for teachers that were down at the Capitol fighting for their students. And I continue to fight for hardworking families and, and find a solution to make health care more affordable. We didn't even get to talk of much about health care tonight, but I know that it's a, it's a big issue in our district. And, and we need leaders who are going to make sure that our economy works for everyone and that kids in Arizona can achieve their American dream. So it has been an honor to represent you, and I uh, ask for your vote and your support again. Thank you. Aaron. No offense, Amy, but this was way more fun than your bat mitzvah mem memory serves. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everybody who came out. Um, people in this district are amazing. They care so much about the issues, and they bring so much passion to it. I want to thank everybody up here. Um, I've come to appreciate, as has my, my wife and my son who are here, um, what it means to put yourself out there in public life and what a sacrifice that is. And I deeply respect everybody up here. Um, I also have really fundamental you know, different views about what we need in the state right now to take it forward. And I want to get back to an Arizona that really works for everyone. That's more focused on the common sense solutions that will move the whole state forward. And um, to spend 10 decades of one party rule, and you can count on one hand the number of bipartisan bills that come out of the legislature every year, tells you all you need to know about the other side. And the challenges that we have are not going to be fixed by the same people who created the problems. We need some new voices down there who are willing to take fresh approaches and look at things with fresh eyes, and people with a proven track record of getting things done. I'm asking for your vote. I will always listen to what you have to say, even if we disagree, and I hope you'll consider voting for me on November 6th. Thanks so much. Kathy. My name is Kathy Pappas Petsis, and I'm running for the State House. You have two votes for the State House, and you should use both of them and I asked for one of those votes to go to me. The reason is, is because my community service in this legislative district for decades has yielded me the endorsements of many organizations 
Stand for Children, the Arizona Chamber, the Phoenix Chamber, the Arizona Police Department, or excuse me, the, the Association of Police Officers, on and on, you can see on my, on my website. And what's interesting is, is that I'm the common denominator. I am that person that these individuals, that these organizations look to and realize that this is someone who can convene and get things done because that's what I've been doing for decades in this legislative district. I have never been elected previously. I have not been doing things for my personal self-interest. It has been for the greater good of our community. And so for that, I ask for your support. I ask for your vote in November. And Maria. Thank you everyone for being here and uh, for listening to us tonight and for your great questions. Delivering results, bipartisan results. I've been two years in the legislature and uh, I've, as I said earlier, I've focused on enacting laws that help people, everyday people like all of you, women, children, strengthening our public safety laws, um, veterans, helping them transition to the workforce, small business people. I come from a small business background. I understand how burdensome regulations are and I've worked to enact legislation to reduce those burdens. You have to focus and you have to ignore a lot of the static, a lot of the divisive rhetoric that we hear so much of in our politics today. And I have shown by example that I can get things done and I work across the aisle. With all due respect to my Democrat colleagues, in the last 10 years, there has not been a single piece of legislation sponsored and passed by a Democrat elected in LD28. Republicans are getting things done in LD28. And I appreciate your support. Thank you. All right. And I'd also like to thank our candidates. If we could please uh, give them a thank you for participating tonight. All right, Aaron, we're not we're not quite done yet. I've just got a couple of uh, sorry. I know it, I know we're running a little long. I've just got a couple of things to wrap up. Uh, thank you again for participating. Thank you for putting up with me for an hour and a half. Thanks to the audience for our questions, for taking the time to come and inform yourselves. I'd encourage you if you have time after this debate, please go to www.cleanelections.gov slash voter dashboard. There's a customized experience there where you can explore the elections. You can learn more about these candidates. You can watch the debate again if you want to put yourself through that one more time. Um, or watch other debates if you so choose. Um, we also ask there's uh, evaluation forms for the debate that you could fill out on your way out. Please do so. That feedback is really important. It helps shape the way we host these debates in the future. And we'd really appreciate your input. Thanks again for coming. You're welcome to stay and, and talk to the candidates a little bit afterwards. Thank you so much for being here.